Hi there and welcome to the Jane Anderson Show. I am thrilled that you are here and for today's podcast. We have a very special guest today and I am so thrilled that to uh, in- interview her today so that you can hear about her and her incredible practice and of course her genius. Um, our guest today, she is an expert and leading authority in what is called service leadership and customer service uh, and she works with clients all over the globe delivering really high energy, engaging key notes, training programs. Um, She's a conference speaker and a trainer and she really brings some incredible experience, passion, excitement uh, and a lot of humor (laughs) to her clients. She's got over 22 years experience in her uh, field and she's worked with and presented to over 50,000 people. She is the author of two books and uh, she's been featured in places like Sky Business News, CEO World, CEO Institute, all sorts of places. Um, and she is also one of our members of our Women with Influence community. And she's done an incredible job growing her practice, not just in the, her expertise, but also being able to run her. her um, she's a real shining light in terms of how she runs her family, how she runs the home, and being able to balance this incredible expertise she has and the potential she has for growing her practice along with how she um, runs everything outside of her uh, work life as well so please join me and i'm sure you'll enjoy this interview today with the one and only monique richardson all right welcome to today's podcast i'm so thrilled you're here and to our very special guest monique richardson yay <laughs> Thanks, <Jane. laughs> how are you monique thank you so much for joining us oh it's my pleasure and greatest joy Jane just to be able to be with you is just always the best thing uh it's always the big love fest when we catch up (laughs) it's great Monique you have had you know a phenomenal trajectory in your your growth in your practice um you are obviously as I mentioned in the intro you're a customer service expert and you have um you know really started to really I think um reshape how this conversation happens uh, for organizations but can you take us back before we get into all the all the meaty stuff for those who don't know you would you be able to go back to you know what does it look like when you started out and how have you got to your practice to where it is today well I started out with my practice when my eldest daughter was actually one and I had left you know the corporate world and then was one of those things that I sort of thought rather than taking maternity leave, I knew I didn't want to go back into that sort of full-time role. So I just sort of thought, we'll just see what the universe brings. And then just started to get a couple of phone calls from people that I used to work with Mm -hmm. and just being able to say, would you, you know, can you do this training? Can you do that training? And I then had a conversation with a dear friend of mine, Peter, and he said to me, he said, rather than specialise in everything, because I was in that very specific training and development role where I used to do lots of different things, Mm -hmm. he said, why don't you focus on what you are most passionate about and for me it was always service I'd worked in service since I was 14 years and nine months old and so for me it really felt right to then be able to you know start that practice which sort of happened by accident the next thing I had a business card and and then Mm -hmm. you know people then just started contacting me and calling me and here we are the business turns 23 in December so wow 23 so you started off you know, for a lot of women who are listening to this, who I think this is really interesting because, you know, it looks like you just woke up like this and you have these books and, uh, but there's a massive journey behind that. Um, how did you make this transition from, it was like you said, you were a contracting and you had little ones and you had all this happening and now over to, into your own practice. How did you make that transition? Because it's a, a big transition to mm-hmm. make. And it really made sense for me to be able to do the the subcontracting work. I always had um, a number of my own clients, but then worked as an associate for other brands and particularly with four children and a very, very busy life. It just, you know, for me, not having to sort of do that business development and work on the practice and just be able to book those dates in and then go and deliver. So it was always all of my own IP. It was my design. I still met with clients and so on. But it was then just making that really strategic shift, which I made in January 22 that then I was only going to purely focus on my own clients so when you shift from a 
you know, predominantly subcontracting model. I still had some of my own clients, but still a, a huge amount of subcontracting to my own clients. That's where there was a really, you know, big shift. But that also was a massive mindset shift to then be able to then be responsible for, you know, everything and, and particularly the business development side, which had always yes. been a 100% referral business and still right. continues to this day. So it has been a, a referral based business, which is something that I feel immensely grateful for. But it was still a really big shift. But I think draw, having that line in the sand and giving myself a date to be able to say, okay. this is what I'm going to do now. And I just passionately love having my own, you know, clients and practice and designing my own client experience experience and you know how I like to care for my clients it's just been the best thing I could have ever done yeah uh it's a big leap uh, you, you know I think you make a really great point about you know just making a decision like a decision that right because it's it's sort of a bit of I know when I shifted from contracting you know going oh I'll see how we go and you know and you're, but you're sort of in this accelerator clutch kind of world mm -mm. it's the the decision to go right I'm going to do it because it is a big change from you know, when you're just delivering, because you don't have to worry about creating necessarily new IP or thought leadership. In your case, so we're using yours. Um, but uh, going, okay, I have to go and find clients. <laughs> like these, they used to just come in the door and I just used to go and, you know, deliver. But now you actually got to go and find these clients and and um, find who's a good fit for you. So how how did you do that? How did you go and work out? Well, who were you? You said you had lots of word of mouth and referrals, but did you do anything else that you need? Was there anything else in particular you needed to do to go and find new clients? Well, I think the things that I've sort of done in my practice have still helped it to continue to be a referral business and it, it still continues but there are things that you have to do and you know fortunately I've had some incredible uh, coaching with an amazing person called Jane Anderson that's been you know very you know specific about getting that newsletter out every week um, also making sure that those you know LinkedIn you know posts are, are visible of being able to nurture you know your existing clients so I, I do believe having it you know, a focus on that has also been instrumental. And then also you've got to be able to have that system for following up the referrals and then how you take care of your referrers. And even when you get those inbound inquiries, you still have to be very responsive and getting back to people. So for me, it's been nurturing you know, my existing clients and then nurturing new clients that do come in that have been referred, but then also really nurturing referrers because I'm also so grateful for the referral work that comes in as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really key one because it's, I think we can sometimes forget our history or the people that we've known from the past. We go, okay, I'm just going to go work with all these people now. I'll start, mm -hmm. with scratch, scratch, start with a list from scratch, but but you didn't do that. And um, so we have to celebrate your new book. Hooray! Yay! <laughs> I serve <laughs> like we lead. So this is your, what book? Is this your second book? Second book. Yes. yes. So the first one you did was around managing difficult customers. Correct. Yes. And then you've written, now you've written this one. Um, so tell us all about, uh, so this is serve, they serve like we lead, how to take care of your people so they take care of your customers. So tell us all about your new book. This is my heart book, Jane. This is the book I always wanted to write. So right. the Difficult Customer Behaviour book just came out of COVID when I, as soon as I saw customers fighting over toilet paper, I knew our customer service community was in trouble and just seeing the accelerated behaviour, I was just like, I have to do something. So that book literally came out of a meditation. Whereas right. this is the book that I'd wanted to write for about 10 years. Like I'd always oh. wanted to write this book. Right. So the book for me was about always being able to work, you know, so much with the front line, internal teams, but then also working with leaders. But I just remember that point where I was, particularly when I was delivering a lot of, you know, frontline training, just hearing the impact that either an exceptional leader made or having that, seeing the impact of just really poor leadership. And I remember seeing that quote from Sir John Sainsbury, they serve like we lead. And I still remember that moment that I saw it. And I said, that just sums up everything that I have ever seen in the world of service about the difference that like an exceptional leader makes or the difference that having a really terrible, you know, non-customer, non-people focused leader. And I said at the time, one day I'm going to write a book called They Serve Like We Lead and it's going to have, that's going to be the title. And so for me, it's a really 
practical book that yep. puts people and customers at the centre, but it is all about how to be able to lead in a service-driven and people-driven way. So, you know, it's the way that I wrote it was so that, you know, you could read the book, but then also at the end of it, there's reflections, there's yes. also actions. What am I going to go? Yeah. So I wanted it to be a, a really practical hands-on. I can read this book and it's also going to give me skills and tips and ideas that I can go and practically apply. So there's only a little bit at the start that really talks about that difference between servant and service leadership, but then yes. it's a really practical hands-on book. Yeah, there's a um, something I really love in here where you said... Uh, which is about recruiting, and you said um, rec 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 bleh, recruit people who have um, uh, service in their soul, I think is mm. what you say, um, from memory. Can you tell us a bit about um, what you mean by that? It's one of those things that, you know, if you get people that genuinely want to be there to take care of the customer, that love people, that love being of service, that love caring and, and serving other people, we can teach people skills and we can teach them systems and we can teach them the CRM and so on. But having that at the heart, you know, for me always is the start of all service excellence. And I remember doing a training session. It was a public program that I was running and I was, you know, chatting to somebody who came in and they were the first participant of the day and we were just having a bit of a chat and she said, oh, she said, can't believe I'm here. She said, uh, I hate customers. She said, uh, I hate dealing with them. She said, I hate oh, yeah. talking with them. She said, I just, I just can't stand dealing with customers. Oh, I no. said, I said, that's really interesting. I said, what is it that you do at your company? And she said, I'm the receptionist. And I went, okay, we've got a problem right here. So, you know, you know, a still a really lovely person just did not want to be there to look after the customers. Completely wrong job fit. So I actually spent some time, even though I know that they'd sent this person to me for the day to be able to hopefully get them to deliver great service. It was just fundamental, you know, wrong job fit. And I suggested, mm -hmm. you know, what else do you enjoy? What are the things that it turns out you, you know, loved numbers and systems. And so I actually did some mini coaching to be able to go and explore that because we have to have people that, genuinely want to be there to to care to take care of people and yeah. and that is where everything starts and if you can get that one right everything else will follow oh I love that um and Monique you, you've worked with some incredible organizations from you know sp sporting retailers um associations um local city councils um who are the, who do you find are the type of people who who typically engage you? Is there a specific type of, you know, industry that really connects with you or a mindset with a type of client? What do you find? One of the things that I've always found so fascinating, Jane, is the diversity of the industries that I work mm -hmm. in. And so, you know, literally can be from, you know, a, a huge, you know, sporting arena through to a, you know, healthcare. It can be, you know, do a lot of work in local government council. It could also, you know, be working with a football club. I can then be with an IT company. I can then be with <laughs> logistics. It's just, I love that every week. I look at my diary and just go, the diversity of industry is extraordinary wow. and because I customize and tailor everything that I do that's what also I love because you know I don't do generic no. programs they're all bespoke they're all created for the client I love getting to know the client and you know being able to really tailor that but I think there's two things that I find really interesting one is is clients that recognize that we really need some help on this you know customer experience journey you know we're here yeah. and this is where we want to be and there's a gap and mm -hmm. so you know I always love working with organizations that have identified that gap it's part of their strategy is another really big reason why I'm there so customer focus has become a really important part of their overall strategy mm -hmm. and interestingly the really great ones but want to just get even better Right. And so they're already delivering, you know, great service, but how do we just take service to that next level? So it's a really interesting dynamic of different, you know, clients, but at the heart of it, they all genuinely want to be able to look after the customer and their people. Well, I think that's a really important point, Monique, because how often do you find, I, I don't know about you, you know, I came from a pretty strong customer service background like you, and, you know, people would say to you, you need to go and work with this <laughs> business. They just have the worst service. You need to go and work with them. Go ring them up. Go tell them that you need. they need to work with you. But I think you make a really great point is that it's about 
which clients value your expertise because otherwise you're on kind of a crusade that Mm -hmm. you're probably going to lose because they if they were if they were really valuing it then it wouldn't be as bad and it can do you find people say that to you all the time (laughs) oh definitely I'll get that oh you need to go here or this happened to me on the weekend or you know I had someone the other day that was so cross and they put in a complaint they said I'm going to email them you know I'm going to email them your details they need to get in touch with you this very animated angry customer so but you're right Jane like I, I will never do you know training or anything for, for, for training sake. Like, you know, if, yeah. if I did ever get that sense that this was just a tick the box, I'm not the right fit. Cause I, I care too much and I care too much about yes. the outcomes and also making sure that, you know, also that, that, that values alignment um, yes. for me is also really, really important. Yeah. And, and you can't care more than the customer. Like you, you know, that's just a, a losing battle. And I think that's hard sometimes, you know, if you if you're at a stage of growing your practice that thinking, oh, is there enough clients out there for me? You know, there's that sort of scarcity mindset sometimes and I've just got to got to do what it takes. And that happens for a little while, but mm. over time, you know, it's nice to be at that point where, you know, you don't have to necessarily um, work with those that are doing the tick and flick exercise and Mm-mm. being able to go, that's okay. Someone yep. else will help them. Yeah, and and I will work with anyone. I don't care where you are. And I always say that it doesn't, I've worked with organisations literally like at the three, you know, out of 10 in terms of looking at their sort of service culture and I look at where they are now. I, I never, ever mind where people are. But, you know, what we want to do is have that mindset that we want to get here. And so if people are genuinely wanting to be able to make that shift, then I can work with absolutely, you know, anybody. Yeah. And Monique, when as you've grown your um, practice, what have been some of the big learnings along the way? Like you've had an incredible um, trajectory, like really making this decision only, you know, 18 months ago, even though you've had your practice for some time, but you've really committed to making this change and and stepping into your own light and and being the thought leader in this space. What have been the things that you have um, been the biggest learnings for you over the last 18 months in doing that? There's been so many, honestly. It has been, you know, I, I think if I look at my learnings and I thought that I'd already learned a lot, but the last, mm. you know, particularly three three years, three and a half years, and and that because there was a point that had to lead up to that, you know, yeah, decision, right. that that's where there's been, you know, my biggest learnings. And I think for me, it is definitely around trusting yourself. Right. I think that's a really big one. Like, you know, lots of different people will, you know, give different advice. Um, trusting for me is a really big one. I think also investing in mental mentoring that's Mm -hmm. been really significant and making sure that you have you know the right mentors and the right you know people and communities you know around you as well but also too it really is doing the work and I I know that there's no no no, and I know we have a hashtag in our community that says you know hashtag do what Jane says but like you know (laughs) it is about doing the work because you can be have the best you know advice or you can have the best you know mentoring you can have the best ideas but if we don't execute on that you know for me that has been the biggest thing and it's been everything from you know getting my show reel done through to doing my you know collaterals and and brochures and you know making sure that I you know get everything you know that I say that I'm going to do, that I actually do it, doing those LinkedIn posts every week, you know, writing those articles, writing those books. You know, it's one thing to be able to say that this is what I want to do, but executing on that. So, you know, I've been blessed to have some incredible mentors, you know, surrounding me throughout these past, you know, three and a half years um, for different areas, you know, in, in my world, but that has just made the world of difference. And then executing on the brilliant advice that you're given or else you'll still be in the same place. Right. Yeah, it's easy to say I don't have time to write a book. I don't have time to write my blog. And, you know, I love that quote where it says, Beyonce still has 24 hours in, in the day, <laughs> same as the rest of us. But you in particular, um, uh, you have, by the way, you have uh, how many children? I have four children and one fur baby. Yep. <laughs> And so you have a lot going on. You have your hubby as well. And so you're running a household for most women who are kind of going, you know, I don't know if I could do this with all this stuff on my plate and to be able to run a practice. And for some, it's not. For some, it's like, you know what, actually, I'm going to wait till the kids have left home. I know that that's better for me. But there are some that have um, younger ones who are sort of navigating through this. 
how on earth have you done that? <laughs> really interesting question. So I think <laughs> one of the biggest things that I have done has been around looking at what I do genuinely to maximize my time. My and that also involves outsourcing. I am the biggest fan of outsourcing in the world. Right. So that has been from looking at things like making sure that I do. Like if you, you've you got to be able to calculate that down to like an, an hourly rate to then be able to go, okay, well, you know, things like cleaning, you know, with that many people and beds to change. Like it's just, yeah. it's huge in our house. Like my mum's with us as well. So we've got a family of seven plus fair baby. Um, mm -hmm. You know, things like making sure that I, you know, do the shopping, you know, online. I've just found an incredible um, food delivery service, which is pretty probably one of the, my life's highlights. I always right. said when I got to a certain point in my business that I was going to make sure I did that. Yeah. But also to, you know, to be able to, you know, I, I did, you know, choose to have um, in-home care. So that was something that I, you know, that I sort of felt was going to work sort of for us as a, as a family. So on those right. days that I did work and then tried to sort of keep it that I worked sort of having my Mondays, you know, as my life admin day, yeah. you know, Fridays as business development and tried to sort of keep that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It doesn't always work like that but that was the way that I sort of structured you know particularly with the the children mm -hmm. having that calendar management then so that you can take birthdays off you can take you know special you know events at school and things like that as well so that you can be present but um, I do think that also and my writing time is like 5 a.m like I do genuinely right get up between 4 30 and five o'clock in the morning I'm wide awake anyway okay. um so I'm working on book three at the moment so I was writing at 5 a.m this morning so right. I have that couple of hours between five and seven that there's right. nobody else in the house awake and it's just me right. so I've and those chunks of time and making sure it's in the calendar to write the newsletter to do the things that you know we need to do calendar management outsourcing and also that 5 a.m club for me massive uh, <laughs> there's so much you can get in but and when you outsource your so what I love about this is because often we can kind of think about outsourcing as in oh I'll get a a VA and but you're talking about outsourcing your or, or all the other things you need to outsource so it's not just about your business but it's about things that you need done at home yeah correct and that's oh. right down to an app that I found called Laundry Point um, you laundry know, and point. they laundry okay. point okay. and like they come and get all the sheets once a week and wash all the sheets because, you know, for me to wash that many, you know, it's those things. That's We've a lot got of sheets. It. <laughs> it's a lot of sheets <laughs> and, you know, outsourcing, you know, the ironing and things like that. Like I genuinely, I remember when I was about 15, Jane, and I was working at Safeway, I did offer part of my wage to my mum to get a clean up. That's how much I despised anything domestic for like right. my whole <laughs> life. But I also go, what do I want to do? I want to be able to do the work that I love and I want to yeah. be able to spend my weekends and evenings, you know, with my family yes. and having that time so you know if we if I work hard on that that means that I can do that yes. so that that for me is also you know about thinking about all of those things that I can do to maximize my time for my business and most importantly my family yeah because there's an opportunity cost correct that time you yeah know, it's like well what's the best use of my time different if you find something really fulfilling and you know but at the same time is going okay well do I really need to do this and um and those sites are fantastic you know there's so much more available every time I turn around there's more you know between um what is it air tasker which is mm -hmm. what did you say it's a laundry laundry point best laundry in the point. world <laughs> um you know all these sites so I think it's mm. so much more um there's so much more available more help available we've got the gig economy where people are you know um looking for different ways to be able to increase their income and do different things that you mm. can do. um and to um having um food readily available like that's uh, food delivery services you know we do I remember we we're talking about recently just you know, these things affect your delivery too. Like mm -hmm. even if it's not necessarily like you think about what's return on investment of your time, but I always think about return investment of your attention too, because in the time that you're thinking about how many sheets need to be washed and how many, what needs to be cooked for dinner and all these things is that something kind of misses out, like whether it's 
a, a workbook doesn't get finished properly or a handout's forgotten mm -hmm. to take to a workshop or, you know, something's something's dropped somewhere and they're all little things that sort of start to add up, aren't they? And they do affect, you know, we can talk about how can I improve the quality of my delivery? Sometimes it's things outside of the business that we need help with to continue to improve the quality of our delivery in yeah. our business but it, definitely you know, I'm thinking VAs all the time or graphic designers but it's not that necessarily all the time is it yeah and for me it's both so I think that's something that you know you've been instrumental in you know helping you know me to be able to look at but also to having that help for my business and the person yeah. who was the incredible you know, graphic designer, you know, having yes. a wonderful executive assistant that, you know, is able to make sure that that newsletter gets sent and to be able to, you know, help with all of those, you know, tasks. And I've, I've recently just put on a, um, you know, a wonderful new business manager as well. Yay. So, um, you know, just for a certain amount of hours per week. So there's the support there and then the support, you know, at home. So by having both of those, it allows me to focus on what do I love to do? I love to take care of my clients. I love to deliver and I love to write. So wow. that keeps me you know, doing what I absolutely love most, but I've got the support to enable me to do that because, you know, life's a lot. It's a full, you know, and busy and crazy life and I love it and I wouldn't have it any other way. But, you know, I've also got to be really strategic about time yes. and and really being able to maximise, you know, those hours, you know, in the day. And then, you know, usually between 9.30 and 10, it's down to sleep. So <laughs> <laughs> you're cooked. You are so inspiring. You make it look so easy, Monique. Like with the the things that you're you obviously are such an incredible mum. Your kids just adore you. Your photos of the the time that you get to spend with your kids and your family and your mum, of course, and hubby and Timo, of course, the puppy. <laughs> um, can't forget Timo. Um, but you know, you just it it all looks so easy, doesn't it? Like, you know, it from the surface, like, oh, you know, is that all she does? Oh, how how easy is that? You know, I can do that. Um, but it's not till sometimes when we get into it that we're behind the scenes or, you know, if we think about the iceberg, we see just the surface level mm. stuff, but underneath there's all these things going on. Um, and it can be a bit overwhelming for some people, particularly when they're starting starting out and going, oh, my God, I've got to write a book, I've got to do keynotes, I've got to speak at conferences, I've got to... <laughs> um, all these things I've got to do. What advice would you have if, for those who are listening to this and for them if they're trying to take their practice, particularly through to if they're coming out of those six figures into seven figure mark, um, or they might be early days and really in those early six figures and trying to really move into the 500s, 600s, you know, it, it could be even 100,000 trying to get through to there. What advice would you have for them about um, growing your practice, particularly if you have other demands outside work? I believe if you can sort of work out sort of what is most important and focus right. on that, mm -hmm. that really does help. So that's where I think having like the values, like for me, I'll, you know, I have a, my own hashtag, which is family first always. So, you know, I look at what are those things that I need to make sure with my, you know, my calendar as well, that I make sure that that's sort of all in there. So I, I do work to, you know, a, a calendar, like a seven day menu plan, all of those things like calendar management, when you're trying to do a lot is, is critically important. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's then being able to look at, okay, what are those just really important? And you can still continue to improve, but making sure you've got those fundamentals of the, you know, the website, being really clear about what it is that you're offering so that then you can you know build those you know collaterals then making sure that you've got your you know something that you've you know taught us a lot about you know with your, your top 150 you know clients that you need to be able to nurture and and look after and then be able to just uh, for me this has been building blocks and you can't yeah. do everything at once like if right. I look at where I was you know, three and a half years ago with an idea to write a book and an idea to do more keynote speaking, I've had to really specifically and strategically look at what are those steps that I need to take. So if it is the idea for the for the book, then to be able to go, okay, when do I want that book to then be written? So I need to give myself this amount of time. Um, does that mean I'm going to put a certain amount of time away each day to write or am I going to block a period? So I do see that tying into to the planning around that, but then working out what are those things that my practice really does 
need. Um, and I think even early on getting some help to do those things and particularly, you know, more of the, you know, admin and the scheduling of newsletters and those things that's, you know, for that's somebody else's genius that yes. they can really help you with. So, you know, I think having that, you know, early on was also really helpful because it allowed me to keep focusing on, you know, clients delivery, developing, you know, and improving of programs, developing keynotes and so on. So, but having that support at the same time was incredibly helpful because that was the, I'd sit there for, you know, three hours trying to write and schedule this newsletter and I'll give it to my wonderful Irina and it's done in, you know, like this. So, you know, having that, having that support early on so that you've got, it just feels like you're being supported um, has been really important as well. So it sounds like you've also spent the time on like the things that you really have to do. So Correct. you really have to do the thinking, like say for a newsletter or the book. So you know you really have to do the writing um, and the thinking and the writing. But after that, it, it's you need the support is give that to someone who is better at it, faster at it. More Definitely. Yeah, and I and I love I love writing. I love you know writing my books. I love writing. I've got three that I'm writing at the moment. But I love you know <laughs> writing. Books. I love writing yeah. you know my newsletters, and I love writing my you know all of my social posts. They're all you know done by me. But then it's the scheduling. That's what you. It's the you know implementing that. So yeah, yeah. and and making sure that that support there is early on because otherwise you're trying to do everything and it can be really overwhelming. Yes. You know, when you're trying to do everything and I think that's what I found early on when I was sort of then had all of these ideas and that was around, you know, writing my books and growing mm -hmm. my practice and wanting to do more speaking and and so on. You know, it it felt, you know, really overwhelming and it still does some days yeah. when you look at your calendar in life and just go, you know, it is a little bit like that it might look like that, but underneath where that, you know, it might look like the swan, but <laughs> this is going on. And yeah. and just before you're jumping on a podcast, someone's fighting over who ate someone's pizza and, you know, it's the reality, <laughs> it's life. It's just not always going to be, you know, perfect. And you think this has worked and something happens, but if you can come back to those values, you know, right. for me, values about, you know, my family, values of taking care of my client value around my you know delivery and what I need to do for my practice and you're right no one else can write those collaterals for you no one else can write those it's got it so it's you and then blocking in time to do it right. so I've just recently done an update on my website I'm working on that I literally locked myself away for two days oh, and you. I just said to the family I need two days right. I can't I can't grab little bits of time I need two yeah. focused days yeah you know, did some cheeky Maccas and did some bribery and extra chocolates. But, you know, for me, you know, blocking time as well to make sure that those, you know, things are done and prioritising. Right. So that's where, you know, I know I've got my planner in front of me, Jane, with my Jane planner, but my, you know, my vision, my year goals, my quarter goals, my three goals for today, and you come back to those to also help to keep that on track. That's also been incredibly useful. That's great. You know, you, uh, what I'm hearing is, you know, the level of, um, this is all self-care, not as in, like, I think self-care, we can think about massages and retreats, but this is self-care of things that, like you said, you've had to prioritise, you know, these are things that matter and then working to those values from there. And that's obviously a big driver for your practice. We are just so in awe of you, Monique. We love following you, your journey and you're cheering you on. You absolutely epitomise every bit of your message and the work that you do around customer service and and um you know I, I think if I'm sure for any organization that says I want I just want everyone in my organization to be like Monique I just want <laughs> lots of Moniques running around in my organization I know our customers will all get the best care and the best love um, because you know the amount of um, thoughtfulness, gifts, things that you send out, kind messages. I think we can all really learn a lot from you in terms of, you know, this is uh, for those who are following, you've got to jump on and get the book, but follow Monique on social media. And Monique, this is, you just, it, this isn't something that you just talk about. You eat, sleep and breathe this. And this is exactly who you are. So we're so thrilled for you with your book for those who want to um, buy your book or if they want to follow you what would you like them to do well my website is just 
at uh, moniquerichardson.com.au. The book is available there and would love to connect on LinkedIn as well. So that's my main platform that I share. And I've also got a weekly service insights as well newsletter that you can sign up for. And that just gives tips around service leadership and service recovery and taking care of customers. So um, would love to. So fabulous. Thanks so much, Monique. So make sure you jump on, follow Monique and um, make sure you read the book, leave her in, uh, a review on Amazon as well and uh, take a look because, um, you know, she walks a talk and it's, it's super inspiring. I think for the future of work and for the future, of, particularly for us as consultants, thought leaders, experts in our field, is our customer service is um, the thing that will, that gains the competitive advantage. I think, like you said, is that, that that's where that's why you get so many referrals and why you've been able to build your practice where it's up to is uh, because of the reputation that you have. So thanks so much for sharing all your expertise today. We can't wait to see the next book you're obviously working on and uh, and we're cheering you on. Thank you so much, Jane. It's just been such a joy to speak with you today. And, you know, in terms of looking at, at generosity and taking care of people and thoughtfulness, you live and breathe that message as well. So, you know, I'm just so grateful to have you in my world. My pleasure. Thanks, Jane.